Have you ever believed a lie? Like something that's totally false, but you fall for it hook, line, and sinker? When I was uh, in my late teenage years, I think I was about 19, maybe in my early 20s, uh, I lived in a recovery shelter that was helping me come out of active addiction. And at the time, they had a lot of rules, one of which was we have a 10 o'clock curfew. And one day, my buddy, who also lived at the shelter, came to me and he's like, dude, I want some chocolate. And I'm like, me too, bro, because chocolate is like one of the deep passions of my life. But I looked at my clock and I'm like, it's like 945, 950. We're not going to make it to the store and back in time for curfew. And I don't want to get in trouble. And he's like, no, dude, it's okay. I've worked this out with the staff. They're fine with us going to grab a quick snack before bedtime. We're fine. We'll just jump out my window. Now, you'd think in that moment that the cogs in my brain would have started to churn and I would have realized that this is not a legit activity if we have to jump out the window. We should be able to just go straight out the front door if he's really worked this out with staff. But I didn't. Uh, He promised me chocolate with no consequences, all right? If you ever want to get me in trouble, chocolate, no consequences, it's a recipe for disaster for me, okay? So we hop out the window and we're going all the way across town to the grocery store, Sherm's. I go in, I get a pound of Hershey's with almonds, and I am just double fisting this chocolate, just loving every second of it. We get back to the shelter, hop back in through the window. I go to bed with a belly full of chocolate on cloud nine. That is until seven o'clock in the morning when there was a pounding on my door. And who was on the other side? But my probation officer with a gift of a pair of handcuffs for me. In about 30 minutes after I woke up, I found myself in a Douglas County jail cell. Why? Because I was out past curfew. You see, I believed my friend's lie that that it was fine and there was no problem. He'd worked this whole thing out. I believed the lie and it had massive impact on my life. Today, we're beginning a series called This Is Our God. And here's the whole thrust of the series. We want to look at the pages of the book of Exodus and say, Who is God revealing himself to be as he's revealing himself to the Israelites, a people who didn't have the scriptures like we do today, who who knew very little about God comparatively to what we have in the Bible today. They would have had some oral traditions about creation, probably Noah's Ark, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's story, some of Joseph. They would have known about the covenant and circumcision, but this was all oral tradition. And in Exodus, they are, uh, God is revealing himself to his people, the truth of who he is. And so we're going to go through the pages of Exodus and ask ourselves, what is the truth of who God says he is? Not what do I think he is, or what has somebody else told me he is? Who does he claim to be? And do I truly believe that? Do I actually live as though that's true? Because believing a lie has massive implications for your life. Believing a lie about curfew ended me in the slammer. Believing a lie about the God of the universe is far more devastating. It impacts our souls. And so we're going to wade into this. I'm going to be totally upfront. This series is going to feel different from the last couple series we did, Philippians and 1 Peter. What we did in those series, we took every sentence apart and the word and the original language kind of parsed it out. And what does this all mean? Put it back together and said, here's what we think this means. We're not going to be able to do that in Exodus. And here's why. It's a gigantic book. If we were to do that in Exodus, we'd be in Exodus for like 20 years, okay? We don't have time for that. So we're going to take bigger chunks of scripture and pull out the overarching principles that are the truths about God, that, that we can then live according to those truths, that we will believe, align our beliefs, our heart, our mind, our actions according to the truth of God, and then reject the lies that we've wholeheartedly embrace because I'm afraid far too many Christians, and I fall into this category from time to time too, have embraced a lie about who their God is wholeheartedly. And like I said earlier, believing a lie about curfew landed me in the slammer, but believing a lie about the God of the universe has devastating effects on your soul. And so uh, as I was preparing, as I was preparing, uh, I came across this quote from A.W. Tozer. He's an author and a preacher. Uh, and he said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's why this series and this idea of aligning our beliefs with God is so important. The most important thing about you and I is what, we, what comes into our minds and hearts when we, when we think about God. 
who is God to you? What does come into your mind? And does it align with the truth of who he claims himself to be? And so I've titled this message in the beginning of Exodus. We're going to be at Exodus 1, 1 to 2, 10. Uh, I've titled it Sovereignty and Suffering. But before we jump into the actual text here, we have to do a little bit of background. A couple of interesting things. Uh, the, the first two words of Exodus in the original language is and now. And now. Well, that means something came before it. And Moses wrote Exodus, but he also wrote Genesis. And so he wrote them as kind of a part one, part two of the history of God's people. And so uh, before we jump into Exodus, there's some things we need to know about some major players in Genesis. We're not going to cover everything in Genesis. We'll be here till next year if we did that. But some major players named Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here is a family tree of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Actually, this one goes all the way down to when Jesus Christ came. And so you can totally nerd out on this. And I'm going to be honest. I'm going to fire hose you with some information about these major players in Genesis because it will help us with our context as we move through Exodus. All right. So Abraham, he had a wife named Sarah. They were originally called Abram and Sarai. And Abraham and Sarah, uh, Abraham was called by God to leave his hometown, to leave his peeps, leave his people, the people in the country that he knows, and go to a place that God would show him. And Abraham's like, all right, God, I'm in, let's go. Even though he didn't know where, where exactly to go. And so he shows this immense faith. But as we continue to follow Abraham's story, we see he's broken just like everybody else. He has a marriage that is something to like straight out of daytime soap operas. I mean, it's like days of our lives level stuff, okay? There's a couple moments where he, he gives his wife over to one of the rulers of an area to save his own skin. And he's like, no, it's okay, dude. She's my sister. You have her. There's a moment where he, he has a lady on the side and he has a baby through her. It brings all kinds of drama into his marriage. And it's just a mess. And God meets these very broken people, Abraham and Sarah, and gives them a beautiful promise. And here's what his promise is. Through you, I'm going to build a great nation. The descendants that you'll have will number as the sand on the seashore. And when they hear this, this beautiful promise of God, uh, he, he said it culminates in that the whole world will be blessed through you because ultimately the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah will come through your lineage, as we see here at the bottom of the chart. Jesus is going to come as a result of the promise that's been given to Abraham and Sarah. But when Abraham and Sarah uh, hear God's promise, they got, they got some problems with it. Number one, they're way beyond childbearing years. And when, when Sarah hears God's plan, she's like, right, now God, in my old age, with my walker and my creaky knees, you're giving me a baby to deal with? Thanks, dude. And she laughs about it. And problem two is she's been barren her whole life. Like she hasn't been able to have a child. And so after God gives the promise, there's a season where nothing's happening. No babies are coming. And I don't know about you, but if I'm Sarah and God said, you're going to have descendants is numbering the sand on the seashore. I'd be like, God, I don't know how many babies we can fit in here, but we need to start cranking these things out, bro. But uh, so they, they, they go through this season of just nothing happening. And so they try to have Abraham have a child through somebody else. And that just brings more drama into their marriage. And ultimately God answers their, their prom, the promise that he gave them with a child. His name is Isaac. And guess how many kids they had by the time Abraham and Sarah died? How many children they had together? One. Isaac. That's it. So what happened to the promise, God? I thought we're going to have all these babies, man. Well, let's crank these things out. But the promise of God was not void because Isaac grew up and he marries Rebecca and they pattern their marriage much after his parents. It's a mess too. And there's infighting and backbiting. They have two sons named Jacob and Esau who are at war with each other. Like even inside the womb, they're fighting and it's just a mess. And, and ultimately they grow up and, and Jacob and Esau reconcile and Jacob marries and has 12 sons one of whom was Joseph. And Joseph is kind of the golden child of the family. And he knows it. If anybody knows it, Joseph knows it. One day he comes to his brothers and he's like, hey, dudes, listen to this. I had a dream about you. Look at what you were doing. You were bowing down to me. Isn't that awesome? I know I'm pretty great. So it makes sense. Do you want to bow down to me now or no, it's okay. So as he's 
pridefully sharing this story. Uh, his brothers, they're, they're just, their anger's inflamed. And they're, they're like, I want to kill this little twerp. And so, so they're like, let's throw him in a well. And, uh, and, and then one of them thought better of it. Like, no, let's not throw him in a well. Here's a better plan. We'll dip his cloak in blood, bring that back to Pops. So Pops thinks he's dead by the hands of some wild animal. And then we'll sell him to slave traders. We'll make some money off this kid. So that's what they do. And they sell him. And Joseph ends up in the land of Egypt as a slave, which is where a major part of the early, early parts of Exodus takes place. And he's in Egypt as a slave. And you think again, God, is your promise void? Like, what's going on here? But God continues to bring his promises about by his power through broken people. And he blesses everything that Joseph does in the land of Egypt, so much so that he goes from the lowest on the totem pole, socioeconomically speaking, a slave to second in all the land, just under Pharaoh. And so Joseph is blessed and, and God continues to bless him, give him wisdom so that he brings Egypt safely through a famine by godly wisdom of storing up food. And at some point during that time, his brothers come to Egypt for resources and there's some reconciliation ultimately that happens. And Joseph, his brothers, and all their people settle in Egypt in the land of Goshen. And this is where we're going to pick up. In Exodus 1. All right, that was a fire hose. Okay, we doing okay? We're good? All right. Exodus 1.1. 1, 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. I named my son Asher, but there's some weird names in there, okay? I can feel bad for these kids. Like, seriously, a kid's name is Zebulun. That sounds like some sort of alien life form. A another kid... Gad, like that has to be the worst name in the history of names. Hard G sound is like the worst sound in the world. But these are the people who came and they settled in the land of Egypt. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. So we're seeing God's promise move from one child, Isaac, the child of promise, all the way. Now we're at 70 people, but we're still not a great nation. We're still not sand on the seashore. And so God is going to continue to bring this promise to fruition. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of God, or the people of Israel, excuse me, were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. I'm sorry, I meant to mention this earlier, but inside your outline, there is a, a, a passage. This passage is on a piece of paper there. Highly encourage you to follow along on that, fill that out, circle things, highlight underline, follow along with me in the passage. We're not going to have it on the screen. I'm just going to read straight from the Bible. And so God is bringing this promise to fruition through, uh, through making these, uh, the Israelites multiply and increase in number. But there's a problem that's going to enter. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Uh-oh, that's a problem. This new king doesn't know Joseph and how he how God blessed Egypt because of Joseph and how God's mighty hand is behind his people. So what's he going to do? Verse 9, and he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. He looks at them and he's like, dude, they are growing in number. They're growing in strength. It's freaking me out, man. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. I love this is terrible relationship advice. He sees that there's a relational tension between the Israelites and the Egyptian. And his answer for that tension is let's make it worse. Like Let's deal shrewdly with them. That's terrible relationship advice. If you take that to your home, it will not go well for you in your marriage or your parenting. But he says, let's deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. This was a very real perceived threat to him. As they grow in number and strength, they were in the land of Goshen, which is on the border of the kingdom. It borders some water and some land. And it's very likely that if invaders came from outside of Egypt, they could have come to Goshen first. And when the Israelites hear from these invaders that they're trying to overthrow Egypt and take over the land, it may very well be that the Israelites are like, yeah, those Egyptians are jerks, man. Well, let's go. We're in cahoots with you, man. And so he's concerned. What if war breaks out and they join with our enemies? Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. 
This is God's people moving from a position of authority and power and influence in the kingdom during the days of Joseph to being oppressed and ultimately put in the institution of slavery. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh the store cities of Pithom and Ramses. You can actually go to these store cities today. Uh, Most scholars, not all, but most scholars are in agreement about their location at this point. They found some artifacts and pottery that kind of verifies the location of these places. But these are places that the Jewish people built for Pharaoh, these store cities. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. So here's, the, here's what's happening. We're going to see this pattern throughout this passage. Pharaoh does a power play, right? He sees that God's people are going in strength. He wants them to be uh, under fear and oppressed. And so he flexes his might. We're going to put you in slavery. Hard burdens, heavy burdens, harsh taskmasters over you. And so Pharaoh flexes his might and God's like, that's cute, buddy. Boom, I'm blessing my people. And he continues to bring the promise of God to fruition. Pharaoh, I don't know if he equated the, the, the growth of the Israelites to God or not, but he certainly was threatened by it. He's trying to stop what God is doing, and God continues to show that he is in control. He has all power. He has all authority. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. Verse 13, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So here's plan A. We're going to make them slaves so that they have heavy burdens. They may even die doing some of this labor. We're going to squash this movement and growth of the people. But God's people continue to grow. So Pharaoh's got plan B in the works. Verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other Pua. That is such an unfortunate name. Can you imagine what middle school years were like for a girl named Pua? Unbelievable. But she said, he says, here's what he says to them. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. So he goes to the midwives in this kind of back door, kind of closed door dealings behind the scenes saying, hey, midwives, here's the deal. Genocide. We want to get rid of it. We want to squash this movement of these people. Here's how we're going to do it. Baby boys, you kill them. Baby girls, you let them live. Why? Because when they grow up, they can intermarry with the Egyptians and they'll be stripped of their identity, their heritage, and their God, be forced to worship Pharaoh as the God king over them. So Pharaoh, at this time, the king of Egypt, he's trying to squash this movement. He's trying to stop what God is doing. And over and over again, we're going to see God is in control. God has all power. God has all authority. Verse 17, after hearing what Pharaoh told them to do, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. This is one of the earliest acts of civil disobedience. That these women, they hear what Pharaoh's plan is in there. They're like, no, we fear God more than you. And that word fear is often kind of misunderstood in our language, but the real meaning of it is an internal awe and reverence of God, an inward reverence of God. And they feared God more than Pharaoh. They, they, they honored God with their life more than Pharaoh. And Pharaoh held their life in his hands. He's the sovereign over this land. He's in control. There is no one higher than him. And they obey God. And what happens? So the king of Egypt, verse 18, called the midwives and said to them, let the male children live. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Verse 18. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? He found out about their their, uh, not following through on what he asked. The midwives said to Pharaoh, and I love this excuse. I don't know if this is what actually happened or this is just an excuse, but this is awesome to me. They say, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes. (laughs) So they're like, we just can't keep up with these babies, man. They're too quick. These women are are vigorous. (laughs) So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. God's promise continuing to move forward that despite what Pharaoh is trying to do, kill all of God's people, move, squash the movement of God among his people, that he, is, uh, he has deeply convicted these women. 
to, to fear him over anything else, and they obey. And as a result of, of it, God blesses them. God blesses them. He's like, boom, husband and babies. And so plan A and plan B hasn't turned out for Pharaoh. So he resorts to plan C. Verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Again, the plan is genocide, but it's no longer behind closed doors. It's no longer hidden and secretive. This is out for everyone. It says all his people. And we don't know if this is a law that goes out, a decree, how this was actually uh, insti- or, or instituted, but, but it's responsible. The responsibility is on all of Pharaoh's people. If you see a male Hebrew child, drown them. This is utter depravity. This is disgusting. This is uh, an insane man trying to thwart a powerful God and his movement in the world. So we see over and over and over this toe-to-toe, this global superpower, Pharaoh and Egypt going toe-to-toe with the almighty God. And over and over, God wins. And ultimately, he says, kill all the male Hebrew babies. And so what does God do? He sends a male Hebrew baby who ultimately would be the one who brings Israel into redemption out of Egypt. Chapter two, verse one. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his, as his wife, a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that the child, that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. She doesn't want her baby boy to drown. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it in bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. So mama has raised this baby as long as she could. We all know babies are noisy and often smelly. She can't hide this thing anymore. So she builds this little makeshift raft that she's hoping will stick together and keep baby alive even in the river places baby in it, and I believe she is trusting her God to do something that she can't see, to keep this baby okay. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. I just, in my mind, I just have a picture of like a uh, big sis kind of just creeping from behind a tree. Like, is he okay? What's going on? Where's Bubba? He's in the water. Okay. He's floating on down and she's watching from the shores. She's watching from the banks. What's going to happen? Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. Uh Uh-oh. Insert some tension. This is the daughter of the guy who says, kill them all. Make sure they're drowned. What's she going to do? And sis is watching carefully to see how Pharaoh's daughter is going to handle this situation. She saw the basket among the reeds and uh, and, and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. She has compassion on this child. I love this moment because this is God thwarting Pharaoh's plans even in his own household. Pharaoh's daughter of all people in the land should be the one to obey what her pops says but she doesn't. God is sovereignly and in control. His power and authority is working it so that this baby is saved and will ultimately play a huge role in the redemption of God's people. And Pharaoh, uh, excuse me, let me back up here. Verse seven, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and, she, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Ultimately, baby boy gets to come back to mom, be nursed for a period of time. And then she or he is brought into the home of Pharaoh, the very guy who wanted him dead. God is in control. And theologians call this the idea of sovereignty. The only thing I want us to see today is that God is sovereign. And that's not a common word. We don't use that word a lot in our language. And it's not a common concept for us because we don't have a sovereign over our land. We have a democracy. So what does it mean that God is sovereign? When we talk about sovereignty, God's sovereignty is God's absolute power, authority, and control over all things. We see that all through this passage. 
But no matter what the sovereign, the king of over this land does, God is in control and he's working by his power according to his promises, all things in the direction he wants. God is sovereign. And I've titled this message, Sovereignty and Suffering, because we see both of those themes in this passage. And as we were talking on the teaching team, we really need a definition of what suffering is. Because some people think of suffering in a very narrow category, that it is a, an extreme physical or mental or spiritual or emotional pain. But really, I was listening to a podcast by Tim Keller. He's a guy, a, a preacher. He recently passed away. He wrote a great book called Prodigal God. I highly recommend. But he said this about suffering, and I thought it was a great definition. Suffering is losing anything that is important to you. That's suffering. God's people here are in the midst of suffering and we can see that God is in control behind the scenes. But I, it begs the question for me, what would it have been like to live in the pages of Exodus? Would you and I, would we have believed God is sovereign when it doesn't look like he is in the moment? Look at this. Verse 10, this is the most powerful man in the world, most likely at this time. Egypt is a global superpower. The Pharaoh is the king over Egypt. And he says, let's deal shrewdly with God's people in verse 10. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them. Lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. These people have been made the lowest on the totem pole. And now they're in the crosshairs of the most powerful man in the world. God, if you're sovereign and in control, what is going on, man? Like, we're in a land that's not our own. You promised us the promised land. You said you'll be our God and, and, and we'll be your people. But, but he feels more like God in this moment. He has control over everything. Our reproductive rights. He has control over our, our, what we eat, where we sleep. He has control over our very life. Look at this. They, they're made, they ruthlessly made the people of Israel to work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service. Look at that word bitter. Understandably, the people of God could have said, look, God, you, you, you promised us milk and honey. What's with the bitterness, bro? And in the midst of their suffering, it's very easy for God's people to begin to question who God is. God, are you really in control? God, are you good? Suffering often brings up those questions of, why is this happening? What did I do to deserve this? God's people often struggle with who God is when life feels out of control in the midst of suffering. So how do you respond in suffering? I don't know what it was like to be in the, these pages, but as I was reading this today or this last couple of weeks, I was deeply convicted on something. I was convicted about how much of my life is a pursuit to avoid pain and how much of scripture is God using pain for his glory and the transformation of his people. I, I, so much of my life, I pursue avoiding suffering, avoiding pain and uh, uh, numbing it, numbing it, running from it, uh, flipping through a screen so I don't have to think about it. Avoiding the pain when God often uses pain to draw his people's eyes up to him to remind them that they really need him. So how do you respond to suffering? How do you see God in the midst of your suffering? Do you ask the questions of why God, why me, why this, why disease, why divorce, why relational issues, why, why is my kid going wayward? Why did I not get the job? Why this financial burden? Why this medical diagnosis? Do you wonder and question and wrestle with the whys of suffering? And that's such a natural place to be. And I don't want anybody to feel shame. All of us do that. I certainly do. But I've found over time, the whys don't ever really get answered. And I was talking to Shauna and Heather there uh, on our teaching team, and we were discussing this, um, this idea of suffering and the question of why. And Shauna, who's our, our, our care ministries director and uh, the director of our women's ministry, she had a really profound insight to me. Um, she said, whenever people walk through suffering, I challenge them to not ask why God, but who is God? 
Can I still say, even in the midst of suffering, when we may never experience this level of suffering, but anything that we that is important to us that has been taken away for us, that's suffering. And can I say, in the midst of that, God, you are still good, and I believe you are still in control. I do not understand what's going on, but I trust you. Like the people in Exodus, they didn't have all these verses about what God was doing behind the scenes. And what did they do? Look at the midwives here. They feared God. Remember that words means an internal inward reverence and awe. They trusted God even in the midst of their suffering and their pain. Do you trust God in the midst of your suffering and your pain? Suffering cast, it is, it can help us see God. It can help us cast our, our view back up to him. And we see that God is being honored even when they were out, uh, when Pharaoh was out to, to get them. These are Hebrew midwives. The, 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 the very people that, that Pharaoh wants to squash. The very people that Pharaoh has placed in slavery. And they honor God in the midst of their suffering because they know who he is. Even with the limited information they had, they trusted him. So how do you view God in the midst of your suffering? And while they may not have seen it, then God is sovereign. And we see this all through the passage. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. God is working behind all these things to bring about his promises that started way back in Abraham and Sarah. That ultimately he's working this slowly together, slowly revealing who he is to his people. You know, God could have deposed the king, killed him and put godly leadership in place, but he didn't. He's slowly revealing himself and, and allowing for a face relationship between him and his people to come to fruition. As they see who he is with the strong, mighty hand in the midst of their pain. And ultimately, the sovereignty of God, his, his sovereign plan is often not what you and I would want. Right? Like if I think back on my story, I would have much rather God saved me when I was six years old and I didn't have to go through addiction and brokenness for many years of my life. But God saw fit to bring me through that season that I might be humbled to accept Christ. God's sovereign. He is in control even when life feels out of control. Life certainly looked out of control from the ground floor of Exodus, but up in the heavens, God was moving all things together according to his purposes by his power. And it looks very different than what you and I might plan. It looks like sending a baby who looks like he can do nothing, who's helpless. And she named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Ultimately, God sent a rescuer in a very unlikely way. This is a great parallel to Jesus, that God sent a rescuer in a very unlikely way, that the God man himself, Jesus Christ, came in the form of an infant with another tyrant ruler over him who wanted to destroy God's people and kill the savior of the world. And you and I have been redeemed, much like the Israelites will be redeemed because that baby grew up and died in our place, that Jesus died the death that you deserve and I deserve. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And on the cross, he took the wrath of God for you, so you don't have to. And then he died, and three days later, he rose again, redeeming you and I. You see, the story of Exodus is the story of God's people. We're included in that. This is the beginning of the promise that you and I have seen come to fruition. And God is working all in and through history, his power, according to the plan of his promises. So in the difficult times, keeping that eternal perspective of what God is doing in the heavens when the ground floor looks real bleak. So how do you respond to suffering? Several years ago, my daughter came to me and, and she said, Dad, I've got an owie. And she showed me her finger and it was a pus-filled wound, infected, yuck. And so I sat her down and I said, Ember, listen, um, 
uh, daddy's going to shoot it straight with you. I'm going to have to do some things and this, you're not going to like it, but it's going to be good for you. I'm going to cut the wound open. I'm going to clean out and drain the fluids. I'm going to clean out the inside of the wound and then I'm going to bandage it up and you'll be good to go in a week or two. And you would have thought, I told my child, we need to amputate her arm. Like she lost it in the moment. Why? She wanted to avoid pain. So what did dad do? I, I cut it open in the midst of her sleep while, while she had no feeling of the moment and cleaned it out. But we often are just like children trying to avoid that pain. And what if, what if suffering is the very thing we need, the, the pain that is a gift that brings our eyes back to God and off of self-sufficiency? What if suffering is the very surgery that our hearts need for God to kind of remove some of the infection and say, hey, remember, I, you need me. We're, this is about relationship. You see, what if suffering is actually a gift? What if suffering is a gift that draws our hearts, our minds, and our gaze back to the one who can fulfill all of the desires of our heart? Jesus. We're going to do a little different closing here today. Um, in a moment, I'm going to release to the campuses and your pastor is not going to come up right away. We're going to have about 45 seconds of silence. And I want you to just reflect on what we've read in the passage, what you've heard, the truths you've heard from God's word. I want you to spend some time in prayer and ask God, God, where am I not trusting you? And here's some diagnostic questions to kind of ask yourself to get to that space. What thoughts consume your mind? What thoughts are, are cause anxiety and worry and fear? Those are probably places that you're not trusting that God is sovereign, that he is in control. He has all power and he has all authority. So we're going to take about 45 seconds. And I just want you to evaluate that in your seat. Nobody's going to come up to guide the prayer. Just you and Jesus. If you've never prayed before, just close your eyes, bow your head, and take out the distractions around you and talk to God. You can talk to him in your thoughts. He can hear you. Talk to him about these areas where you're not trusting that he's truly in control. I'm praying for you as you do this before the Lord. I love you guys. Thanks for joining me today. All right. Thank you guys so much online uh, for sticking around. It's great to be here with you today and, uh, and really wading into a, a tough subject of the sovereignty of God, even in the midst of suffering. And I really want to challenge our hearts today to evaluate it. Just a couple things. How do you view God when you're in the midst of suffering? How do you view him? Is it, it, have you forgotten that he's in control? Do you, do you maybe say, God, maybe you're not good? Does the circumstances of your life feel all consuming and that view kind of edges into who God is? And have you embraced a lie about who God is or are you living according to the truth? When you go through suffering, how do you view God? And be honest with that. And I highly encourage you, talk with a spouse or a trusted friend or your parent about how you view God in the midst of your suffering. And then secondly, is that view of God accurate? Right? It's one thing to acknowledge like, okay, I think God is not good when I'm suffering. But what do you do with that? You need to align that with scripture. Is it accurate? If it's not, remember, we throw out lies and we replace them with the truth. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Let me pray for you. Father God, um, suffering hurts. And God, I, I pray as your people, as we go through the difficult seasons of life, they will come. We are broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. I pray that you will help us to trust that who you say you are is true, that you are good and you are in control even when life is bad and feels out of control. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks for joining me.